Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name's Ella and today we're gonna be doing another missing children case. Michaela's watching me, so this is awkward. <laughs> if you guys are new here, please press the subscribe button and turn on the post notification bell. So every time I post a missing child case, you can watch it. Okay, so today we're gonna be talking about the Sodder children disappearance. So basically, this case is about a family of 12. And on Christmas Eve of 1995, their house caught on fire and five out of the nine kids that were there that night died. However, the parents and the surviving siblings believed that the children who died actually survived. And they really thought this because the bodies of the missing children were never found. So they thought that someone had taken them or they escaped and never came back. There were also a lot of suspicious things that happened around the house before the fire that led a lot of people to believe this. Okay, so to start from the very beginning, George Sader was born Giorgio Sadu in Tula, Sardinia, Italy. He came to the United States when he was 13 years old and eventually he changed his name to sound more American. He moved to Pennsylvania to work on railroads, but shortly after he took a similar position in Smithers, West Virginia. Once he moved here, he started his own trucking company. Shortly after, George George met his wife Jenny. So George and Jenny, they got married. They moved to Fayetteville, West Virginia, which was a town with a lot of Italian immigration. They lived in a two-story house about two miles out of town. Their first set of 10 children was born in 1923. George's business was going very well and it was making them a well-respected middle-class family. George had some very strong opinions about politics back in Italy. He actually really disliked the dictator of Italy and a lot of the people in the town didn't like him because of this, especially since there was so much Italian immigration. George was like the odd one out. By 1943, their 10th child, Sylvia, had been born and their second son, Joe, had left to serve in World War II. In October of 1945, a salesman came to the Sodder house. He told George that his house would go up in smoke and his children would be destroyed because of the things he had said about the dictator. Another person had come by the Sodder's house and told George that the fuse boxes were going to start a fire. So George was really surprised by this because he had just had the house rewired when they had an electric stove and Installed. There really should have been nothing in the house that was flammable and could have started a fire. In the days and weeks leading up to the fire, some of the older Sodder children had seen a lot of suspicious behavior and like people watching the younger Sodder children, but mm -hmm. no one really did anything about it. There wasn't really much they could do since nothing actually happened. So the night of Christmas Eve, the kids were really excited as most kids are and they asked to stay up later than usual. Jenny told her kids that they could stay up later than 10 and she and her youngest daughter Sylvia went to bed upstairs. 14 year old Maurice and nine year old Lewis took care of the chores that they had to do and went to bed. George and his oldest son, John, who was 23, and his other son, George Jr., who was 16, had been working all day, so they were already asleep. The rest of the kids decided to stay up. At 12.30 a.m., the phone rang, so Jenny went downstairs to answer it. She heard an unfamiliar voice of a woman who seemed to be in a party room. There were glasses clinking and lots of noise. She heard her laughing and it was really just kind of creepy and unsettling, but she hung up the phone and went back to bed. While she was downstairs, she noticed the lights were still on and the curtains were still open, which was something that the kids usually took care of before they went to bed. Jenny saw her oldest daughter, Marion, asleep on the couch, so she took care of the lights and the curtains before going back upstairs to bed. She assumed the rest of her kids were in the attic where they usually slept and didn't check on them. At 1 a.m., Jenny woke up to the sound of something hitting the roof of their house and rolling, but she didn't really think anything of it again and went back to sleep. The next time that Jenny woke up was 30 minutes later to the smell of smoke. She got up to check it out and saw that George's office was on fire. It seemed like the fire had started from the fuse box, just like the random guy who came to their house had said. So Jenny woke up George and they woke up their older two sons. Jenny and George, their older two sons, Marion and then Sylvia, the baby, made it out of the house alive. They yelled to the kids who should have been in the attic, but the stairway to the attic was already on fire so they couldn't go up there to get them. John, the oldest son, in his first story to the police, he actually said that he was able to go up and check on the siblings, but he changed his story later to say that he only called up to them. So there was a lot of weird things that night that made it hard for the Sodders to get help. So it was hard for them to get a hold of the police because their phone was broken, their telephone line seemed like it had been cut. So Marion went to the neighbors to call the police and their phone wasn't working either. So so someone had to go into town and call the police and that's when they finally got a hold of them. But remember that the Sodders lived two miles out of town, so this probably took a while. There's usually a ladder outside of the attic window that the kids slept in. George and John went to the backyard to climb up the ladder to the kids. But the ladder was nowhere to be found, which was really weird because it was always there. George tried to pull his trucks up to the window to climb up, but neither of his trucks could turn on. The living family members had no choice but to stand there and watch the house burn down with the other kids in it. The fire 
fire department didn't respond until 10 a.m. the next morning. Apparently since they were short staffed, but that seems like a really long time with the fire being at midnight. So by the time the fire department got there the next morning, all they could really do was look through the ashes. It had been about 10 hours since the fire and they didn't find any bones. So this is the first thing that led the Sodders to believe that their kids were actually alive. And it's also said that the search wasn't very well done. This seems like this case wasn't really handled properly and if there were bones, the Sodders didn't really know about it. The fire department <laughs> concluded that the five missing children had died in the fire and that it was hot enough to burn all of their bones. They told the Sodders not to do anything with the house and just to leave it so there could be further investigation, but they didn't listen. Four days after the fire, George and Jenny bulldozed what used to be their house and made it into a memorial garden for their missing children. So moving on, one of the people on the jury for this case was the man that threatened George. So this was like a complete conflict of interest since He's literally could be a suspect, but he was on the jury for this case somehow. So the case moved on, death certificates were issued for the five missing children. Basically everyone except for the Sodders concluded that they were dead. There was a funeral held for the five kids on January 2nd. The Sodder family really had no choice but to move on. Because of this, they questioned that night a lot. Their Christmas lights were on through the beginning of the fire, which shouldn't have happened because their power should have been out unless the fire had started for some other reason. The ladder from the attic was found around 75 feet away from the window and it looked like it had been hidden. And that ladder was always there, so it was really weird that someone had like taken the ladder and moved it. A phone repairman told the Sodders that their telephone line hadn't been burned and it had been cut. So whether it was an accident or on purpose, whoever did it would have had to climb 14 feet into the air and reach over two feet to cut the wire. On the night of the fire, neighbors had seen a man at the Sodders house stealing equipment. He admitted to cutting the phone line thinking it was a power line, but claimed it had nothing to do with the fire. So unfortunately there wasn't any record kept of this man, of the suspect, and there's really not a lot of information on it. And it, looked, it seemed like no one really looked into it further, which was weird because he cut their phone line on the night of the fire but nothing really happened with it. So Jenny really doubted that her kids had died in this fire. Since the authorities concluded that their bones had been burned completely in the fire, she wanted to test this out and find out for herself how hard it really was for bones to be burned completely. Especially since there were appliances that were damaged in the fire, but weren't nearly close to being completely destroyed. So for Jenny, it was really hard for her to believe that the fire had burned through the kids' bones completely, but their stove was fine. She actually contacted an employee of a cremation center to find out how hard it would actually be for a fire to destroy the bones. She found out that the fire would have to be around 2,000 degrees and burning for two hours consistently, which wasn't even close to how long the solder house had been on fire. George believes that his trucks were tampered with on the night of the fire and that's why they wouldn't start, but his son-in-law said in 2013 that they may have flooded the engines since they were in such a hurry to start the trucks. So that could be why the trucks wouldn't start. The phone call that Jenny received the night of the fire was also investigated. The woman who had placed that call was identified. It was confirmed that it was just a wrong number call and that it had nothing to do with the fire. As time passed from the night of the fire, more and more information started to come out. A bus driver had claimed that he'd seen people throwing balls of fire at the house. Once the snow had melted, Sylvia found a small rubber ball outside of the house. This could be explained as what the bus driver had seen being thrown at the house, and it also could explain the noise Jenny heard the night of the fire. After the fire, there were a few people who came out with sightings of the Sodder children. One woman claimed she saw them in the back of a car watching the house burn, and another woman claimed she served them breakfast the next morning after the fire, and she noticed that there were license plates of a Florida car in the parking lot. George would take every single little sighting of one of the kids super seriously. He would take action in finding them and he would travel to the places where the sightings were. He thought a girl in a ballet magazine looked like his nine-year-old daughter Betty, so he drove all the way to the ballet school in New York to look for her himself. Unfortunately, he didn't find her and he was asked to leave the ballet school. George also tried to convince the FBI to take this case on, but since pretty much everyone had concluded that the kids just died and that these were parents who were in denial. They refused to take the case on and they just thought the kids had died. In August of 1949, George convinced someone to do another search and investigation of where their house had been. Nothing was found except for a few bone fragments which seemed to be vertebrae of a 16 or 17 year old man. However, it's unlikely that these belonged to any of the Sodder children since the oldest who was in the fire that night was only 14. These bones also had no exposure to flame so it was really unlikely that they belonged to any of the Sodder kids. The Sodder case gained a lot of attention. It actually went to 
the West Virginia legislature and they closed the case statewide. Shortly after this, the FBI actually did take on the case for a little bit, but they dropped it after two years with no successful leads. The Sires were really discouraged that no higher authority would take on their case and that everyone just believed their kids were dead. So they kept the case alive on their own. They printed flyers of their missing children and they offered a $5,000 reward that doubled for any information that would bring closure to even one of the cases. Shortly after the reward was offered, another sighting of the Sodder children came out. A woman named Ida Crutchfield claimed she saw the kids weeks after the fire. She ran a hotel in Charleston, West Virginia and said that they came in with two men and two women and when she started to talk to the kids, one of the men turned around and started talking quickly in Italian and none of them really spoke to her the rest of the time they were there and they left early from the hotel the next morning. Since she took five years to report this sighting, it's not very credible, especially since she didn't see any pictures of the missing kids until two years after she would have had this sighting. Every time there was a new sighting, George would drive to the place and speak to the person and a lot of the times it was just nothing. In 1967, the Sodders received a letter from a woman who said that Louis Sodder had identified himself to her when he was too drunk and now he was saying that he wasn't Lewis. She said him and his brother Maurice were living down the street. She didn't actually speak to George but the police did find the two men that she claimed were Lewis and Maurice and George got to meet with them. Both of them denied being the Sodder children but George really doubted it so he spent the rest of his life wondering if he had really met with his sons that day. However, since they wouldn't claim that they were the Sauter boys, there was really nothing they could do. One day, Jenny received a letter from Central City, Kentucky. It had no return address and it just looked really weird. Inside, there was a photo of a man that looked like Lewis, but who was about 30 years old and that's how old he would have been at the time of this letter. On the back of the photo, it actually said his name. The Sauters hired someone to look into this, but there was no information found. So it seemed like if these really were the missing kids, they didn't want to be found. It seemed like they wanted to connect with their family, but they couldn't. The Sodders really felt like there was nothing more they could do if their heads were alive and weren't going to come out and say it was them. There was really nothing they could do. Jenny and George said that if their kids died in the fire, they wanted to be convinced that they actually died or they wanted to know what happened to them. So they spent the rest of their life looking for their kids and they never found anything. George died in 1969 and Jenny spent the rest of her life working on the memorial garden where their house used to be and spending time with her remains kids and grandkids. The only person who never spoke of the fire was the oldest Sodder boy, John. He thought the family should move on and that his siblings died in the fire. A lot of people kind of found that suspicious since everyone else in the family wanted to keep looking and he just wanted the case to be closed so people thought maybe he had done something. So Jenny kept the billboard of her children up until 1989 when she died. All the living Sodder children and their kids except for John continued to work on the case for the rest of their lives. They wanted to bring attention to it and they believed what their parents believed and they wanted to continue on that legacy and find their siblings. So the biggest theory of this case is that the Italian mafia actually took the kids. Since George really spoke out on how he disliked the dictator of Italy and there was a lot of Italian people in their town that really liked the dictator, a lot of people thought that the people who didn't agree with George were trying to get revenge on him and do something to make him pay for what he had said about the dictator. If they were taken by the mafia, it is most likely that they were taken back to Italy. And if the kids had survived and they knew their family was alive, it was likely that they didn't want to make contact because if they did, the mafia would probably come take them again or kill more people. The only known surviving member of the Sauter family today is Sylvia, the youngest kid. She says the house fire is her first memory and her and her dad spent a lot of time talking about it after it had happened. Sylvia's daughter says that Sylvia promised to her parents that she would do whatever she can for this case and keep it alive as long as possible and do whatever she could to find her siblings. Most knowledgeable people today believe that the Sauters died in this fire, but they wouldn't be surprised if they were found. What I think is that they they're alive and they were taken by the mafia. It just seems like too much of a coincidence for someone to actually come to George a few weeks before the fire and say that his kids were gonna die in a fire. I think it's unlikely that their bones were burned all the way through since so much in their house wasn't damaged. So my theory is that they're alive somewhere or that they have died of old age now. So let me know what you guys think in the comments below about this case. If you have any other cases you want me to cover, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to do cases that you guys want to see. Press the subscribe button and the bell button so you can see every new missing person case I do. And thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!